Thank you all for coming out. Um, this is part of a series of events we're doing this semester. Um, we're doing the Filmmaker Friday conversations. Um, we have some production kickoff week things going and then some rough cut week things going at the, towards the end of the semester after you guys have all done your productions. So keep an eye out for all those emails and I'm sure your faculty will be telling you about those as they're coming up. So um, please try to attend as many of those as you can. Um, this event in particular came up after kind of talking to a lot of students and finding out there are a lot of concerns from you about set safety, set etiquette, and not knowing how to deal with certain things and being uncomfortable on sets and just not really finding your place. And if you do, often it's way later in your career as you're a senior and you kind of, the people who have said something were kind of like, is there a way to fix this for the other students after I graduate? So we were like, you know what, let's figure something out. And uh, Jenna's been pushing for a set etiquette type event for a long time, so we said, this is the semester to do it. Let's just do all of the events, find out what works, talk to you guys about what you want, and then make those changes as best we can. The hope is that all of this will just become part of the culture, and we won't have to always be holding these events unless it's necessary, or we just want to hear from you guys, or just hang out and eat pizza and talk about set life for a little bit. Or if um, you want more of these events, yeah. they'll definitely happen. Definitely let us know. Uh, we will do as much as we can for you guys. It is why we are here. So um, unless Mark has anything he wants to add. Um, yeah, just I'll, I'll pop up at different times and um, just raise your hand if you want to uh, um, add index cards to the, uh, to the pile. Um, and then part of the intention of us um, taping this is that hopefully we'll all regroup after this and look over any index cards we didn't get to and either send out an email or do a little recording to be able to answer some of those questions. Um, just so uh, feel confident that if you don't get to something today, we'll cover it again in the future. Um, so after kind of a short, not short, but after some stuff we want to cover, uh, this is mostly for you guys. So we're going to open it up to you to ask questions. It does not have to be the anonymous ones. Um, if you just have questions, we really want you guys to kind of lead this as best we can. Um, and if it gets too off topic, we'll try to steer it back or that kind of thing. So, um, you know, please participate, ask questions. Uh, we also want you guys to give your experiences. So if somebody asks a question and you can answer it, please, you know, feel free to answer it. This is not just us talking to you. We want this to be all of us talking together. Hi, I'm Jenna, <laughs> Professor Jenna Burchett. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here because we cannot have these events without attendance and this is like, I'm so jazzed right now. I'm blown away by how many people are here. Um, and so what that tells me a couple of different things. First, it tells me that you like pizza, so check. And then two, that tells me that you really do care about the culture and the community here at Towson and EMF and you want to like help to develop that as a positive culture for yourself when you graduate on film sets. Um, and for the people that are around you. And so if you look around the room and you don't know someone in here, I hope maybe at the end of the event when we're closing, we'll use a couple more minutes to mingle. Just introduce yourself to someone that you don't know. We have an incredible variety in this room of um, lower class, upper class, uh, people in 221, people all the way seniors in, in a real world portfolio class. And so mentorship doesn't always have to be from faculty. In fact, I think you all can learn so much from each other and develop your own little micro communities here at Towson. Uh, so I wanna open up by talking about kind of three pillars that I feel, what, well Steve just got up, but Sorry. the four people sitting up here, we've been together and separately in a collective of over like a thousand different sets at this point, like a thousand different shooting days. And so as you all have learned in your production classes, this is a learn tree. Um, or if you're in 221, you're starting to kind of discover this is a learn trade. You don't learn everything on how to be successful in a film set in one class in one two hour period. Um, I'm still learning every day that I'm on a film set and so that's why I love the film industry because 10 years deep you can still acquire all that knowledge. Um, but I want you all to, to realize that we can be teaching each other. You, it's not just about, and I know you're already doing that, but it's not just about faculty teaching you. It's about you all developing a community and so like the three kind of pillars I want to focus on until we go to whatever you've decided that you, that you really want to know in these index cards is the fact that um, 
a safe set starts by establishing a healthy community. And that I hope in, in your classes, and if this is not the case, whatever we can do to help make this the case, I hope that your classes feel uh, less sterile as they might in other in majors where maybe you're just sitting and um, listening to a lecture and I hope that it would feel more collaborative. That's one of the cool things about being in a film class uh, or a media class in general is that you get to collaborate with one another. So how do you establish a healthy community on set? Um, and then just a reminder, we will also cover some topics of, uh, revolving around set, set safety, harassment, and some more Title IX type issues. So whatever is said in this room, we are all mandatory reporters with Title IX, so it's just important to say that disclaimer now. Um, but if there's something that you want to talk to any of us about individually after, please know that we are mandatory reporters and that we can assist you, and we're always here. Our door is always open in any way. And I bring that up to say, I know that you all follow the news, and I know you all hear about the culture of the film industry, what happened um, with Kevin Spacey, what continues to happen with fair treatment in terms of equity, of gender, of race on film sets. But that starts here. It doesn't start when you graduate. Um, I have had, an, uh, keep it anonymous, but over five cases of sexual harassment reported to me as a professor in my five years of being here at Towson. And it's always been students with other students on film sets. And so that's outside of our classroom. And so I do bring that part up not to come off as a lecture, not to strike fear into anyone, not to make anyone feel uncomfortable, but to know that that is something that does happen um, and something that we want to just make you feel comfortable walking in, into a film set and knowing you have so many options for how to get out of any tense situations or how to make sure your, your sets represent all the qualities that you as an individual represent. And then lastly, practical working conditions. So. If you want to know about what it's like to work um, a safe set with child actors or people that are far older than you on set or locking down a busy street or if you should work near train tracks or not or any practical things that we can answer for you. So talking about developing a safe and healthy culture, talking about any types of uh, sexual harassment or any type of harassment of any kind, anything regarding Title IX um, or how that translates to a union set and then anything involving just practicality of working conditions, fe please feel free throughout to just, if it's not on a card, if you don't want to wait to fill out a card from Mark, if you just want to raise your hand, we can talk about any of that stuff today. Um, and if you want to come up to any of us after today, know that our doors are always open to talk to you about these things. So what a really important thing for all of us at Towson and in the media labs and in our classes is to develop these opportunities for professionalism for you all to bring in um, I know you know we work on film sets but sometimes it's just nice and refreshing to hear from a new voice so we've brought today a Towson alum he's a part of the Emmy award winning sound team as a boom operator on House of Cards He's also the chair for IATSE 487 for safety and education. Um, if we could give a warm welcome to Steve Sada. For being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having me here. Um, so, uh, like she said, my name is Steve Sada. I'm the um, chairman of the Education and Safety Committee for IATSE Local 487. We can get into all that weird stuff later, but that is a, the local union here, so it's the production local. Um, and if you're unfamiliar familiar with unions, uh, this is a great environment to talk about unions because safety and safety and community is what unions are all about. So before I get into that, I kind of want to ask you all a question: uh, What makes you most comfortable on set when you're at work? And like seriously, I, this is probably the most important thing when it comes to working in the real world, working as a student, is set safety and that sense of community and how comfortable you feel to be able to do your job. So what makes you feel most comfortable? And if you participate, you can come up and get some Free swag. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Yes. 
there's communication um, between like the um, crew, the director, the manager, so that everyone knows what is expected of them. Absolutely, also, yeah. everyone on the same page. It's super important. Um, <coughs> uh, it always makes me really comfortable when either uh, someone uh, higher up, like producer or uh, assistant director. Um, uh, introduces themselves, um, learns your name, uh, so that you know that like you can come to them and present your problems or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome, That's awesome. Great. <coughs> uh, like more control environments for a set. Like it's maybe something about train tracks because if it on set, we're shot near train tracks where trains would come through. So yeah, not that. <laughs> <laughs> Got not, you. Not that. Not that. When there's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Yeah, that is definitely connected to safety. Um, Making so, sure you're staying awake. Yeah, exactly. All right, so all those things that you mentioned uh, are, you know, and I'm going to kind of get into some union stuff a little bit too, but everything that I talk about when it comes to unions, should you shouldn't think of it as something that only happens in a union world or a union set. It should, it should transcend to anything that you do, your student films, non-union productions when you're in the professional world, whether you're in production, post-production, anything like that, these are all uniform. So when it comes to a union, all of these things are these you know these concerns that you have and what makes you feel safe. All of these things are really focused on, uh, and really the only difference that there should be with a union and non-union setting is that in a union setting, these things are actual laws. So, for instance. Um, one of the most important positions on a union set is a position called a shop steward. Uh, I'm a shop steward, uh, and there are tons of other shop stewards in the area. A shop steward is a union representative for that crew. So when you work on a production, you have you producers, you have above the line executive people uh, that a lot of times you don't feel you can communicate with because they're really their you know main concern isn't always your safety or your well-being. Their main concern is the money part and the, you know, getting the day done. Um, so when it comes to a union job, there's something called a shop steward. So that person is the representative for the local and for those union members. So we are there to be the liaison with crew and with the uh, production and with the uh, higher-ups and with our national local. Um, so I guess the easiest way to put it is that shop steward is like the HR department of a production set. Um, so if you were on a student set, who would you, who would you be able to like point as a shop steward? What role do you think, if they were to start saying, maybe this is a good idea for us on our student sets to, to say that someone gets to be a shop steward, if they're already in a different position, um, who, might, who might pick up that position as shop steward? Um, I think in that setting, uh, you know, obviously I feel like a professor would be a perfect person for that, but if you're talking about on set, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe someone who is a senior and has the most experience, um, or someone who is the producer. So I know that a lot of times in your classes you have, you have to kind of delineate what your jobs are, you know, DP, producer, sound. Um, <laughs> and you know, you kind of get into this weird funk where, you know, you're all kind of trying to do your own jobs, but then when, you know, to be honest, when the shit hits the fan, you're all kind of trying to fix the problem. And you're all, then you start, end up arguing with each other, and like, you're not, you're not kind of on the same page. So it's kind of good to have someone that, uh, you know, acts as a shop steward that is the one that you can go to to communicate with. And I think the best person would be the person that's in the producing position, because that's only gonna make you a better producer when you graduate. Um, and it's probably better to have it be someone who's a senior maybe or just someone who's a little older I don't, I'm not really sure but I mean it it's hard because you kind of deal with I mean you're in school you're still dealing with you know obviously you know sometimes you're in groups where you're having personality issues maybe or you have you know it's a really stressful situation uh, so it's kind of hard to turn to another fellow student and have them kind of answer these questions. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really important to have someone in charge of that, and I think it should be like the producing role. Yeah, and yeah. then I would add to that, if you're all sharing roles on set, if it's your first set, if you're in film one, it's okay to ask who's comfortable fulfilling that role as well, because there might be somebody that does feel comfortable going to a professor if there's an issue, and someone on set that doesn't feel comfortable. 
um, or someone that does feel comfortable going to Title IX if there's an issue and someone on set that doesn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. But it is totally acceptable within your pre-production because you're all going to meet anyway. You're all going to do your storyboards or talk about your script or talk about your location to just take five seconds to say, who wants to be in charge of safety? And then you don't have to have that discussion again. And so if anyone feels unsafe on set, they know that there's a peer that they see that they feel comfortable going to to say, hey, maybe we, we should be further away from these train tracks. Or, hey, we haven't eaten in 10 hours. Or, hey, because you, you guys just get in your own heads and we've all been there and, and we all went to Towson. So we all have been in these film classes as well where suddenly I'm realizing, oh, we're wrapping at 1 a.m. but our schedule says to start at 5 a.m. the next day. Yeah and that that's actually not okay. And that it's all right to have that conversation, but maybe if there's a point person in your crew that knows that they can, that you're the person you can, go, they're the person you can go to, or that they can just kind of stand up and say, all right, we need to rework our schedule, or we need to rework these locations. There's a lot more of a, a moment of breath that you can all take as a crew, just knowing that that's something that's taken care of. Right. So, you know, and I think that is something that can lead into a communication part. So. Communication is totally key in anything that you do. Um, when it comes to union productions, it's almost it's almost like a, a law written into law where you have to communicate exactly what you're doing. We have safety meetings every morning going over the exact schedule of the day. But that's now required. Could you just so, say maybe what happens at a safety yeah, meeting? Yeah, so a safety meeting is always run by the first AD. And what happens is before, so say your call time is 7 o'clock in the morning. So at 7 a.m. sharp, Everyone reports to set, and it's immediately you do a safety meeting before you touch any gear, before you start prepping anything. If you are working, everyone drops what they're doing, and they all come together in a big circle. Um, so that part of it immediately starts the day in a community setting. So you're immediately around an, a first AD or sometimes a director or a key grip or uh, a second second or another PA. It's, per, it's, um, it's projected on walkie, so if you're not able to be there, you can listen to it on walkie-talkie. But... Essentially, the first AD talks about everything that is going to happen that day, anything that has to do with safety, even if it's the floor is a little bit wet because it rained and we're outside, so watch your step. Something as simple as that can lead to an injury, and it happened on House of Cards. We had a first AD, funny enough, had a safety meeting, and then slipped and fell and like totally dislocated his leg. And first AD is first assistant first director assistant for director. anyone Sorry. that might not know that. Um, so, you know, you want to talk about everything. and. Yes, when it comes to productions on the higher end, it, it's a, not only a safe thing, but it's a liability thing as well. But the most important thing is that everyone's on the same page and you understand what we're doing. Whether there's a stunt happening, if there's special effects, if we're working with fire, uh, weapons, and that's another thing. When we, if it's something that has to do with weapons or special effects, our special deck supervisor will there be there to talk about that. To talk about how he will show you guns on set and show you every gun and show that it is a non working gun, that there are no live rounds. Uh, you know, if, if there's, if we're on a working street, there'll be a bucket usually in the middle of the circle that has all safety vests. And you are required to wear safety vests if you are within, I think, 20 feet of a working street. These are all rules that they enforce in a union world. But, like I said, none of this should be only restricted to a union world. And there's nothing wrong. And there's nothing embarrassing about being safe. When I was a student here, safety was kind of like this weird second thought. Because what was more important was getting the project done and being artists. And yes, we are all artists and that's really important. But when you get to the real world and you're working and you're starving for that art and trying to achieve that art, that's when you're the most vulnerable to be injured or deal with safety issues. So I think it's really important as students to understand that the most important thing and the priority is your safety. It, and it might come off as something extreme, but it's totally true. Like you're not working in a safe environment all the time on productions. Well, and can I, can I just sure. add in too, that there's always a reason to have one because of Steve's first point that it helps the day off with establishing a community. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you all put out a call on Facebook or whatever for extra hands on set, and that person may not know anyone on that set. And so it just gives a point for maybe like the first day of shooting for everyone to just say their names really quickly, or everyone to say their roles really quickly. So if you have somebody that's a production assistant for the first time, and they're learning what a director of photography does or what, an, what a director does on set, they can put faces to names. Mm -hmm. And then also it can be the smallest things. Uh, the majority of commercials that I am on that have a child, 
that's part of the safety meeting, to tell you to watch your language or to tell you to like where their holding is, which means where they are when they're not on the set, mm -hmm. to give them privacy or give them space. Or if we're outside, there's always a, a conversation about poison ivy or wildlife or where the bug spray is, where the water bottles are. It can just be simple stuff. It doesn't have to, you don't have to think, oh, we're not near this dire condition. We don't have to have one. It's always just a good idea just to have a conversation at the beginning of the day. So that way there might be someone in another department that's kind of thinking, oh, I saw some poison ivy earlier, and this is a moment for them to just step up and say that, so then everybody's safe. It can even be as small as an extension cord has to be run across the center of set today, and it's a tripping hazard. Right. It's it, it just like I would, as the producer, or as the first assistant director, or as any person that is going to be working on that set, just keep their eyes out for anything, and utilize the safety meeting as that moment to just, you're just having each other's backs. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's, like she said, it's pointing out faces that you can also go to when you have issues. So usually you introduce the shop steward, you'll introduce the set medic. Mm -hmm. So if you're feeling like you, you're feeling dizzy, you know exactly who to go to. And it works on commercials, works on long form shows when you're with everybody all the time. Um, but you know, one more thing to add to that too is that it also comes into play when you're working in an, uh, on a scene, for instance, that's a closed set where if there's nudity involved, uh, if it's a sex scene involved, because that, that, that happens in a lot of productions. Um, so they'll usually communicate that and they will designate who is need to be, need to know and need to be on set. So it's, one, it's another way to keep everyone protected, keep talent protected, because they're obviously gonna be in a vulnerable state. Um, and I've been on many productions where talent are just like, I don't want anyone in the room. And that's fine and that is immediately respected. Yeah, where it's a 200 person crew and there are three people in that room. Absolutely, that's and fine. you know, from my experience, I've been told as a boom operator that the talent doesn't want me in the room. And as long as I communicate to the powers that be that, okay, if I'm not in the room, then you know you might have sound issues or whatever, and they're usually fine with it, and like, it's okay. It doesn't matter. They'll figure it out. You know, it's not a position, and it's the same thing with when it comes to safety issues. You shouldn't put yourself in a position to argue to get your job done and do your job better. If it's gonna make someone else feel uncomfortable or make somebody else feel unsafe. Um, and with that, I kind of want to talk about one story. Um, who knows about Sarah Jones? Is anybody familiar with who Sarah Jones is or what happened with Sarah Jones? You can raise your hands if you, yeah. Okay, awesome. So, uh, six years ago, this was a union production. Uh, it was uh, shot in, I think it was shot in North Carolina. Um, they were doing camera tests. So it wasn't even production start, it was camera tests. But it's still a union day. 80s are there, everybody's there. So a camera test is just going out and testing, literally exactly that. You're testing right. out the camera, so you're just looking and seeing if that's what you want to shoot your film on. Correct. So, brief, quick thing of what happened. There was no safety meeting. It was on train tracks. Um, the shot that they were testing was a hospital gurney on train tracks in the middle of a bridge over a river. There was no safety meeting, nothing. And when the first AD went to the producers and locations department and asked them about, you know, do we have permission to be on these train tracks? They said, yeah, absolutely, we're fine. We contacted CSX as the company or whatever. I said, okay. They go bring the gurney, a full camera with a tripod, all the crew goes in the middle of the train tracks. No safety vests, nothing. Train comes. So everyone's sprinting and running while a producer yells, save the camera. So Sarah Jones was the second camera assistant, and she felt that she needed to save the camera and listen to her producer, listen to her boss. So she turned around while everyone's running away. Or she ran towards the train, picked up the camera, put it on her shoulder, started running back. The train rams into the gurney. The gurney hits her. She flies off, instantly killed. The How old was she? She was 26 years old. So the gurney then shattered and it hit five other crew members. So. And that was only six years ago on a union set. So even though, but on a union set that was not run properly. All you needed to do was talk about if you had permission to be there, but it took a producer lying about it. You had to have a safety meeting. If you had that safety meeting, you'd probably have everyone responsible for contacting that person in the middle of the circle, and that would give you that opportunity to ask them, are we safe to be here? Where's the paperwork that says we're allowed to be here? They had none of that, because, and they had no way to communicate that because there was no safety meeting. And they lied because they wanted to get the day done. So the 
biggest, most important thing is to realize that even if it's a union set or anything, there's still problems that arise because of user error and human error, because you're not considering safety as a priority. So Sarah Jones is now a huge, that's that story of Sarah Jones. There's now a, new, a movement called Safety for Sarah. Uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Sarah Slates. It's a whole thing. You can go on Instagram, type in the hashtag Safety for Sarah, and you'll see RIP Sarah Jones on Slates. It's a huge movement now. But the biggest thing I want to talk about before we get into some more questions is that safety needs to be prioritized in a way that is not seen as an after effect. It's not a hindsight. Hindsight in this country is 2020 in most places, and when it comes to safety, it's 2020. What I mean is, is that you wait for something bad to happen, and then you start fixing it and implementing fixes. You need to be proactive when it comes to safety and when it comes to sexual harassment, anything especially when you're on set. So with that being said, I want to kind of open it up to yeah. some more conversations with you guys about really what makes you really feel comfortable and I want to talk about ways that you can be more comfortable when you're working too. And, and I'll just add to that too, um, just because I'm around you all a lot. Um, and that sometimes being told an incredibly powerful story like that, like it clicks, right? And you make, it makes sense and you're like, of course we wouldn't do that. But a huge part of what happens in this learn trade when you're on your first set is building your own confidence um, and thinking about like who you think you're going to be on a film set and deciding like, oh, well, what if I don't know when to speak up or what if I don't know when to say that that feels unsafe? Um, and and so what I can say to help you with that and maybe they have advice to add to that, too, is that gut feeling that makes you go, should I do this? That's the, all you need. That like little voice. That's like, I don't feel really great about this. Um, before I, we've been in this industry before Sarah Jones, and so the first time I was ever asked to go and fly a Condor, which if you don't know what that is, if, if you've seen it, these big construction lifts that boom out and the bucket goes like you know 60 feet in the air. So that's part of the lighting department, and we rig lights off of those. And the very first time I was asked to go up in one. Um, I had never been in one before and I was not provided a harness, I was not provided safety gear to clip in and I didn't know that I was supposed to clip in. All I knew is I was in a bucket that was slowly being raised in the air and I didn't feel great about it. And I love heights, I'm fine with heights, I like to rock climb, all that stuff, it's fine. But I was just like, this seems stupid. And so all I did was take two seconds to get on a walkie talkie to my key grip who was my boss of the, of the department and say, is there a way for me to be like safer in here? And I, immediately he was like, you know what, copy that. Brought me down and then I found out there's an entire harness system and you were supposed to be clipped into that bucket at all times, but this crew just wasn't doing that because they felt confident and what they were doing, which is very stupid, um, and they just weren't doing it. But I didn't get made fun of for wanting to clip in. Um, I didn't get anybody like complaining that I was taking away from their day. They just really took me as a professional, even though I, I was 26 at the time, and they were like, oh, okay, she wants to be more safe, let's give her that opportunity. Um, but I was scared to even just like ask that question. But I can tell you that it's worth it. And now, after Sarah Jones, you will not even go near a union set with a condor without seeing people clipped in. Um, because sometimes it does take that hindsight, which is awful. So what I can say is just, if you're not sure, if you're like, I want to be safe, I want to speak up, I'm not sure if what this person said to me was offensive, I'm not sure if the way this person walked past me and maybe touched me inappropriately, if I should say anything, will I lose my job, will I get fired? If you have a little voice that questions any of that at all, this job is never worth your life. There's always going to be another gig, even if you don't end up staying on that specific gig. And that listening to that little voice is literally all that you need. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that, that at the end of the day, even on the most safe of sets, you're the only person looking out for yourself. So when you hear that voice, stop, take a moment. And if you need to, if, if it's something that truly puts you at risk, you have to be the one to say something. It's really, really important that you guys do elect either a safety officer or make sure that it, a lot of your sets won't have an AD. Typically an AD is who people talk to. But there should be somebody on set that 
is the person to talk to because the director the cinematographer are all going to be doing other things and you can't be going to that person who's really busy and, be, and let them know all the time so it's really really important to have that person and that person should then report to your professor to one of us to michael uh, angelo the chair of the department or really any other faculty here um, whoever you feel comfortable with um, yeah but it's really important to have somebody be that point of contact um, on each set. And it's kind of up to you guys to elect who that should be, whether it's a producer, assistant director, or just somebody who you know is going to be there on every single set with you guys. And, and know that as professors too, we won't judge you if you have a question in pre-production if something's not safe or safe. I've had so many people reach out to me and say, we're going to be shooting in this location and there's a dark alley and it's at night and I'm nervous about like walking to my car alone, what do I do? Or we're gonna shoot near train tracks, I've had that question before, what do we do? Or I wanna light this scene with fire, what do I do? And, and even if something seems kind of silly, I've heard some of the most oddball questions you can imagine. I'm never gonna, like we will never laugh at you. Our job is to help inform you and give you confidence and empower you on how to do things a safe way. So also know in pre-production and even on set in production, if something's happening, the moment that it's happening. You know, I've had a student that had graduated text me and say, I think I'm being sexually harassed, but I'm not sure. Can I talk to you about it? And I literally told my class to take a break. I had gotten the text message and I went out in the hall and I called that recent graduate immediately to help them. Um, and I'm not a one-off professor. Like We should all be accountable to do these things for you as well to help you gain that knowledge and that confidence. So, so I wanna ask if anybody wants to share, feels comfortable sharing maybe a success story of a time where they, they, they work to make their set safe um, or a time where they kind of overcame a challenge like this where maybe you worked as a crew um, and, and you worked to kind of foster a positive environment for your set. I have a story, I guess. Um, sure, yeah. I was on a film where I was acting and I had to do a lot of stuff work and I was repeatedly slammed into a wall uh, um, and it was a long take so it was I, we had to go through it about eight to seven times, and I felt super uncomfortable, probably by the third one, honestly, because I had slammed, I had been slammed into the wall, and a piece of the door hinge was in the wall, and it went right into my spine. So it really hurt, and I was in a lot of pain, and once we finally got a take that we could call, like, usable or done, um, the stunt coordinator tried to ask if we could get another one, because it looked like I hesitated at one point, and so I went to the director and I was like, I am not doing that again. Uh, that is incredibly awful if I do that again and I would be in more pain than I already am. <laughs> yeah. And, and so ultimately, do you think, and, and I'm glad you spoke up and that's awesome. And do you think if you were ever in a situation similar to that again in the future, you'd speak <coughs> up sooner? Yeah, for sure sooner. I think I let it go on too long because I was trying to like, I think there is a lot, like especially as a as talent, I think you get a bit of an ego to be like, well, I don't want to bring the crew down, or like, like because you know that everything's kind of focused on you. Um, but it is like way more important to just make sure you're safe and make sure that everything's all right. Because going through that and then like having months of back problems is not worth it uh, for just a shot. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely not worth it. Yeah. And, and so what about, what are some of the conversations you all have if you know in your set you're going to be shooting somewhere that maybe doesn't feel like a safe area or a time you've been on set, that um, maybe you're shooting in an environment that doesn't necessarily feel safe. What are some of the conversations that maybe you're already having as a crew when you know, when you're looking at the script and you're going, ooh, it's gonna be 20 degrees out that night, or oh, we need to shoot near, uh, there are, is a scene with a train or, or anything like that. What are some conversations? Lauren, did you have one? Well, there was this one point where I was uh, a grip on this set. <laughs> I like, it was, it was a super high, like it wasn't a seat, I probably didn't even stand, but it was like over two stories. So there's a balcony, it was close to the balcony, and I was at the bottom, uh, but there are two power lines right in between the lights. And also, <laughs> started raining and I still wanted to take the shot of me. So we put it down and put the umbrella on it and we're holding it and then you see the rain start going like this. 
in the hole, like stay on this ground like this by the power of fire. So, yeah, like, there was like, and I was still holding on to this thing. Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> so, so did you just continue to? Yeah, until I was like yelling at people to come out, but I should have just kind of like left. It's like, you don't want it to fly into the house, but also there's lightning and power lines, so. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was, yeah. It was well, really and so can you think of in the future, like, what you would do differently? Because yeah, I think this is a yeah, good it's safe a space. And I would offer, if you, if, if it's starting to sway, first thing, just cut the power. Like, okay. first thing, before you're trying to, like, play the game of operation and bring a light down in between power lines while it's moving, one, yes, don't put it there, but two, <laughs> just cut the power, okay. like unplug the electricity. So in the very least, now it's just an object that's gonna hit power lines. And if yeah. it starts to go, you move and you leave and you let it fall. And this goes for any piece of equipment ever. Like if, they're, if you're worried about a fee or if you're worried about the damage to the equipment, like let it fall. Like I've had a like 400 pound dolly start drifting off of a tailgate at me and I bolted and it's, it was fine. There were some scratches, and like, but it's not. It's not worth. It. I'm not gonna save it, you know. So in that situation, like that, like just hands off of it, unplug it, and go. Also, but. no one is gonna thank you for saving equipment because they have insurance. Let them use the insurance. They are more concerned about you getting hurt because you can talk back and hire a lawyer back, and they don't want to deal with that. So let the gear get hurt, so you don't have to. They're going to be more happy with you if you do that. If you get in between the gear, just like with Sarah Jones. And that's, so you know, that is a lawsuit still happening. And two of the, the director and the first AD are in jail right now, just so you know. But it took them like four years to get to prison because they were just, wasn't my fault, you know. So they kept pushing everything off. So, you know, it's, yeah, I, I mean, it's such a, it's so crazy. I'm sorry. That's, that's insane. Um, but yeah, I, I just, Making it that priority that it's your safety over what you're handling is just a number one concern. Yeah. Yeah. Constantly. Please. We put a big thing of, you know, it's your equipment. It's, when you check it out, it's your responsibility. But your safety always comes first. Now, you shouldn't have told somebody to put a light in a position like that. So that's another conversation that you guys need to be having in pre-production is when you're going to your sets and talking about where everything is going to be that you're not put in a situation where you need to put a light in that spot. Um, Mark and I, I forget the exact date, we'll send out an email, um, are gonna be doing for production <coughs> kickoff week an event where you guys send us your setups or questions and we will set them up for you and go through and talk about safety, how you wanna light this, if you want this, that, you know, we'll pull out all the equipment if we need to and set it all up to show you guys how to use it and answer any questions whether it's how do I fake being in a car or a moving car because that's the whole thing with you guys driving shooting somebody who's driving in actual traffic is very dangerous as well mm -hmm. so if you guys have questions like that that is the time to bring up bring them up and Mark and I will work if we don't know we'll reach out to other faculty yeah. even people in the industry that we know to get you guys an answer so we'll be sending out an email about that but if though it before you're on set is the time to be thinking about these things. You shouldn't be showing up to sets completely blind that could be very unsafe, yeah. so. And if you're in a, a, a bind, you can always text me your setup, and then I'll tell you. Or Professor Ashley Benzel, who is here now for lighting, too. Great, so I wanna ask, I wanna go through some of these index cards um, for the remainder of our session here. But what I, what we would like to do um, is read the question out loud to you all and see, uh, and you know, kind of just really help this idea of community and peer mentorship where we can talk together and have one conversation and see what your response to these questions are. And then of course, um, if there isn't a response or if there's something we wanna add onto it, we will. But I just wanna see, since there's such a great variety of experience in the room, maybe what some of you might answer these questions for. So the first anonymous question that we have is what are the best ways to safely lock down a street? And so for those of you that have never heard the term lockdown before, uh, what that means is when you're about to do a shot, 
uh, you don't want people to walk through your shot, right? You don't want people to, if you're shooting a exterior, establishing a storefront, you don't want somebody to walk into the middle of that shot and go into that store. So to lock down an area means to just like stop anybody from entering that area and also stop any crew members from maybe doing extra work or making any kind of noise. So lockdown literally just means to like tighten everything up, make it as quiet as possible so you can get the shot. So again, the question was, what are some of the, what are the best ways to safely lock down a street? So, yes. Um, knowing the difference between lockdown and rolling is important. Um, like, I was on a set where there was like a um, hero car, like being on it like a tow rig. And like, that was what the lockdown was for. It wasn't actually like the interception was shots um, and yeah, there was some misunderstanding about rolling and mm. lockdown in that situation. Well, and that's incredible, thank you. And that's incredible too because, so when you're asked to lock something down, you're okay to ask the question, what's in the frame? And how much of this area am I supposed to lock down as well? You know, so rolling would mean when the camera is actually rolling, and that's when you would need to go to your lockup and stop people from walking through. And then as soon as you hear that beautiful magic word cut, that's when you can let people start walking back through the shot again. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, it wasn't actually like in the shot. It was like clearing the path for the like, police escort and the hero car to come through. Mm -hmm. Good. So yeah. it was like, it wasn't even about the shot, which is where the misunderstanding took place, was that like the, the shot was supposed to be like cleared, but there was, it wasn't there. So like it was like a major safety issue. Yeah. Because Absolutely, thank you. Does anybody else want to add to that, how you would safely lock down a street? Any experiences that they've had yet, yeah, Maddie? Yeah, probably yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Want to add to that? Either one of you, you both were like. Uh, well, I, it was um, my question. I wanted to ask specifically, I guess, more about the permits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like, it's not in DC or Baltimore, like it's just a neighborhood street, but it's like, it, there's sometimes teenagers drive fast, so like, it's like I know I still need to like talk to a, a get a permit, but it's like how do I do it when it's not like DC or Baltimore? It's the same exact way. Okay. Well, I mean, for so Baltimore and DC to get permits, uh, and this goes for anybody, student films and everything like that, you would first contact uh, the film office. So you can talk contact the Baltimore film office, the Maryland film office, or the DC film office. Mm -hmm. They have the con the contact numbers for the. They're not, it's weird, but they're like the film departments of the police department. Um, and they are the ones that control what's called ITC. It's called Intermittent Traffic Control. Um, so you don't deal with you know, people that are just going to say, screw you. That being said, do not, as a student or as not a police officer, put yourself in the street and try to stop traffic. Do not do that. Like, and if someone asks you to do it, don't do it and report that person to the police. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm very serious because that's how people get hurt and you deal with people that are going to decide, screw you, I don't care about your film, especially if you're a student. People are not going to care if they're not involved in it, so they're just going to go right by. So don't put that responsibility on your own shoulders. Get your permits. Call the film office. Ask them to help you. They're super awesome people. They can put you in touch with police department. If you're shooting on campus, talk to TUPD. There should be no reason why they wouldn't help you do that. And if they don't, talk to the department and talk, have them talk to them about it because that should be an open discussion about safety if you want to conduct school business on school grounds. Absolutely. And when it comes to like locking down or getting a, a permit for a street or mm -hmm. whatever, um, does that just mean that you have the permission to be there? Or does that also mean, like, say it were a busy street, that you would automatically need? So those are two different permits. Right. So okay. there's an occupancy permit, mm -hmm. um, but usually that depends on if you're on private property, um, like a warehouse that's abandoned. It's not abandoned. Somebody owns it, and it happened to me in college. I was in handcuffs at the end of the day. So, because we didn't get a permit for a warehouse that, <laughs> so no. definitely get a permit for anything if you're on any kind of private property. If you think it's public property, always check. Um, when it comes to street traffic, that is uh, another whole permit because then you have to have 
uh, paid officers report. Uh, and sometimes they don't give you officers, sometimes they give you um, uh, either guard, like it's like a third party, like cross guard people will come and do it for you, uh, but they have the authority to do so. Um, so sometimes those permits cost money, sometimes they don't. Uh, I don't know exactly those logistics, but know that everything kind of, every single thing has its own kind of permit, mm -hmm. but they're not hard to find out. You can just make a phone call and they'll help you. You can get away with a lot of stuff for free on a student set too. Um, I have this beautiful, magical card right now called graduate school uh, that is allowing me to do the same thing. And so I was filming in Lock Raven um, and I didn't need to lock down the street, but I just wanted to let the film office know I was there and that we would be in the street and then we would move out. It was a very tiny crew. Um, and, and we could see down a long path to know when a car was coming. So don't do this if there's, you're at a bend and you don't know when a car is gonna race through. People really race through Lock Raven. Um, but I was just like, do I need a permit just to even be there? And they're like, what's the nature of it? It's like, this is a non-paid uh, student shoot. And so they just made a mark that I was there. And, right. that, and then that was it. And then I just had to film on a beach um, uh, in, <laughs> Myrtle. Thank you. In Myrtle Beach. I was like, uh, oh, Beach. Uh, and so I felt really, I called about permitting again for a student set um, because I was going to have a pretty decent sized camera on a beach where I knew there'd be like children in bathing suits and stuff. And I just wanted to make them aware that I was there. And it was the same thing. Didn't have to pay for anything. Um, and, and I had, I always, you always get the name of the person that is telling you that you're okay. Try to get it in writing if you can, mm -hmm. um, have it in your backpack. And, and so both of those situations, I just let them know I was in graduate school and I didn't have to pay for anything. So it's better in situations like this, it is not better to ask for forgiveness than permission Correct. because legality is involved. And yes. yeah. make so. sure you're getting permission for what you're shooting. We had students shooting some gas holding tanks and at the end of that day, we had uh, Homeland Security at the department finding out if they were actually who they said they were. So make sure you guys have <laughs> permits for what yeah. you're shooting because sometimes it's just a slap on the wrist. Sometimes it's a really big deal that can end up with people in jail. Correct. So, um, did you have a question? Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I okay. was gonna ask, um, what are there like resources to find out what public process is um, the film offices can totally help you with that. Uh, you'll be very surprised how much information the film office has. Uh, the Maryland Film Office especially, because the Maryland Film Office is a state-run organization, so they are in the umbrella of the arts community and um, the recreation community in uh, the area. So Parks and Rec, they'll talk, you can, they can send you to Parks and Recreation, they can send you to, um, uh, there's this whole zoning department that can probably get you permits to be anywhere if you need to be. And here's the website up here as well. There you so, go. To so, help you kind of put yeah. your eyes on so, it. so you go so. under crew and resources, that's a great place to start. Um, and if you go anywhere in the United States, if you shoot anywhere, almost every major city or state has a film office. And just and if you Google it, you can find their number and they'll give you any resource that you need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, every <laughs> every county, uh, I've personally had to deal with this where the film office didn't know any a, a specific question I had, okay. and they said call the county that you're filming in, like circuit court. Yeah. Um, and they have offices. Every circuit court is responsible for some form of like entertainment and uh, road control. Right. Uh, different offices that can be tailored to what you're focused on mm -hmm. and they should be able to an at least answer questions and then um, hook you up with that information. Yeah, right. And this, this goes into not just where you're shooting but the way that you're filming as well. So for example, like you cannot, if you're near any of the, like the monuments or Smithsonian's in DC, you cannot put a tripod on the ground without a permit, but you can film things handheld. Um, there are it is very difficult to figure out where no-fly zones are for drones. So if you're using a drone for your shot, if you're anywhere close to a military base, they literally will hack your drone, take your drone, fly it, land it, you won't get it back. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally true. And um, FYI, you can't legally fly a drone in this area. Most of the areas without a permit due to the amount of uh, hospitals that are in the area that need to land helicopters. Yeah. So keep that in mind. That's why we're not allowed to have one here because 
we have to let all the hospitals know when we're going to be flying one if we even take it outside to play it, right. play for, play with it for a little bit. Yeah. So just those are the same questions that you can ask the yeah. home office mm -hmm. or any of us as well, and we can help you, can you find out if we don't. Come further in, also. Okay. I'm really late. I don't You're totally fine. Um, so I was going to say that when I worked at the Smithsonian, uh, they actually had a specific rule where you aren't allowed to film in there because anything that you film in there becomes their copyright. Mm -hmm. Correct. And so you have to remember that when you're um, filming stuff, if you ever want to, you know, make it into something that you want to make money out of, a lot of places will be able to claim it as their copyright. So you have to figure that out too. Mm -hmm. It's okay to shoot for film school, but if you if want it to go outside profit, of it, it's going to yeah. cost you a lot of money to get those permits, and sometimes you won't be able to use some of the footage you shot. Yeah. So th there is always kind of a give and take. It goes with, we have um, sound effects, sound li music libraries that you can use for all of this stuff. The moment you try to make money on it, though, they're going to come and ask for their money also, mm -hmm. which is typically 1500 to $2,500. So. <laughs> Remember that, please. Yes. And w one more quick note on <laughs> um, uh, driving days. Um, in terms of if you're in just in a small residential community, you're just even just filming in your driveway, like pulling into the driveway multiple times, um, it's best practice to even just draft up like a little letter or something and distribute it to the neighbors, notifying them, hey, we're going to be filming, here are the times. If you see any strange activity, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good policy for, e mm -hmm. if you have permission for a house, anything, um, just notify the neighbors. Um, you don't have to reach out in person. You can just some, send something in the mailbox, give them a contact info in case they have further questions. Um, it's also a good way of getting out ahead of somebody's throwing a block party that day, you don't realize until you're on set and then suddenly the whole street's filled up. Right. Um, you can get out ahead of the issues if you do your due diligence by reaching back out to the communities you're shooting in. The other good part of that too is, is doing that is also helping you with its a release of liability or it's kind of helping with the liability issue so that you're letting them know that this is happening and if something happens then at least they were notified and it wasn't just you know, happenstance or it wasn't just, you know, they didn't know anything about it. So, again, it's another whole form of communication. Communicate with everybody around you, whether they're part of your production or not, so they're all on the same page so that if anything does go wrong and if there any, is any issues, everyone's aware of what needs to happen. Cool. Um, okay, does anyone have any questions just related to either permitting or locking up a set or filming with a vehicle, any of the things we just kind of talked about before I move on to the next index card. Yeah. Well, my question is on index, and it's kind of on an index card, so it may come up, but it was about locking up cars. Okay, great. So, like, I was on a, I was a lock, lock up PA in Baltimore for a set, and they had these cars that you could, you could come onto a certain street because they were delivery cars, mm -hmm. and they had appliances that had to be turned at certain times and we were shooting on their street and they hadn't told the, the neighborhood that they were coming that week and hadn't told, like, so nothing could be communicated that you continue to come on that street. Right. How could I properly communicate that to the AD without like, because I'm being yelled at by the truck guys and then yelled at by everyone else. Like, how can I properly communicate that as, as an emergency? So, um, for, first of all, and this goes for like people traffic as well as car traffic is like, you never, you're never gonna be able to like physically stop someone from doing something. And so if they blow the take and they go through the take, just like take a deep breath. And if you're gonna get fired for it, then that job, like you're better than that job, and it's not worth it. Absolutely. Um, I when I first started, I was locking up in one of the government buildings in Annapolis, and I was literally were shooting downstairs in one of the, um, like one of the one of the rooms for like we're doing like a huge court case scene, and I was supposed to lock up upstairs. And every woman that worked upstairs wore high heels. And I was getting yelled at by his mentor, Lorenzo Milan. He's an Emmy Award winning sound mixer that he kept hearing like click, 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 click of these heels. And I was running like I was in a video game. Dot every time I would go to one door, another woman from another door, and another. And I was just running, trying to just be like, can you please stop? And I couldn't get them to stop. And eventually the only thing that worked is I like took my shoes off in front of one of them and I was like, can you just take your shoes off then? Like, I don't care. Um, and there was still one woman that just like strutted past me. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, what I did, is, and, and, and the person that was yelling at me is a very nice, wonderful human who's not upstairs and doesn't know what's happening. I went to the person immediately above me, uh, who was the key PA at that point, and I was like, I can't get a hold on this. I'm doing everything I can. Here are the things that I'm doing. 
they, they, part of their reason of being their boss is to come and help you in these situations. So walkie-talkie for, or like if you see the person that's near, like the next person that's above you, and get them to come and help you out. Um, so that's the first, if they have extra advice, that would be awesome. But that's the first thing I would say, is if you feel like you do not have a hold on something, do not go into like meltdown mode that you can't do your job. It just means you need reinforcements, yep. which is why we work in a collaborative industry to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say immediately just go for the person that is above you. And if you're worried about everyone on your channel hearing that, then you can ask to go to a walkie-talkie channel that no one else is on, which is usually channel two. You guys will get to that eventually. And then you just say, I need reinforcements over here. I can't communicate with this person. Um, and so then it's out of your hands. At a production assistant level, like you should not be expected to always have to handle those things. Yeah, your you're own. the first line of defense for other people to come in. Hey, what's your needs? How can we help satisfy your needs? Yeah. And then if it's oh, a student set, you, honestly, it's like you, uh, you might just have to let that person go through and then just get the shot afterwards mm -hmm. because there's no, it's not worth it to sit there and, and cause an argument and then maybe get kicked out of filming at a location or, or risk a physical altercation for no reason. So, yes? It sounds like a location problem for the most part, but having a location Yeah, that's great. That's helpful. Just the head of that department because there are locations production assistants as well. Yeah. Cool. All right, we're going to move on to a new topic. Um, okay, so I want to ask you all first, who do you talk to if you are being sexually harassed on set or if you feel like you're being harassed in general on set? Who, who would you talk to? Yeah. I usually talk to a producer or a assistant director. And why, and why do you usually feel comfortable talking to a producer or assistant director? Um, usually I just feel like they're there for that kind of thing in general. Like we discussed earlier, like uh, on the student set, like that would be kind of the safety realm. So I guess also I'd talk to them. Sometimes though, like on sets, especially if you don't know the producer or assistant director, it's hard to talk to them. So I would talk as well, like for anyone here, uh, talk to the person that got you on this project or that like refer to you because they'll be able to hopefully get you in the contact with the right people. That's great. That's fantastic. Does anyone want to add to that of who they would talk to? And I, I want to combine this with another question that someone asked, which is how would you handle an argument on set? Because I feel like both of these scenarios involve kind of like feelings of needing confidence or um, needing to kind of take a deep, deep breath and, and face a situation. So I think you, you could answer either. If you, if you feel like you know someone is being harassed on set, if you feel like you are, or if you're seeing an argument kind of happen on set, how do you deal with those situations? Yeah. I think reflective conversations are always a good idea and probably like if you're in the argument, like asking if you could step aside so it's not distracting to everybody on set and then having a reflective conversation which is to say like I want to listen to what your issue is and then reflect or say back like this if I've heard you correctly this is your issue did I get that right if no they repeat what you didn't get then you repeat again and then at the end of it you say okay well like once you get it right is that all if not keep going mm -hmm. um, oh. and then at the end of it like you know it, like if, if it's all then it's like okay great and then people feel heard um, and then you actually have heard because a lot of times in arguments you're just waiting for your turn to talk mm -hmm. um, and you're just like talking over each other so yeah I want to add a highlight thank you I want to highlight something that you said here which is taking the situation off of the set um, this goes for if there's an argument that's happening a disagreement that's happening that could escalate into an argument especially if you're in front of talent or if you're in front of someone that you've like asked a client or someone that you've asked to be on your set that's not part of your immediate crew, even if you're trying for more than two minutes to decide what the shot is going to be and it's starting to get tense, have this conversation off to the side because sometimes just moving out of that room 
helps to diffuse the situation because people are no longer like nervous or embarrassed that there are a bunch of eyes on them with the pressure of the clock. And then in terms of harassment, sometimes if someone looks uncomfortable, it's also okay to just be like, hey, do you need someone to talk to? To be that person to be like, do you wanna go talk about something? And bring that off of the set too. Because if someone feels like, um, even harassment can mean so many different things. It doesn't have to be someone touching you. It doesn't have to be somebody stalking you. Sometimes it's, it involves body language or comments that are like very under the radar. And sometimes it just like, you just need to be brought away from that person for that person to be able to report or be able to have a conversation. So I would say always like take a second to think, take a breath, and then just move whatever the situation is out of the immediate set to have those conversations. And that way you have a safer space where people feel more comfortable to diffuse whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. yeah. I find sometimes it helps me like just so that those situations don't arise in the first place to kind of like not constantly but kind of check in with everyone and see if anyone has any concerns or like any kind of questions going in. So because sometimes if something's bothering me a little bit and it doesn't get addressed, I can kind of build up and then it would become an issue in there. Yeah. So I kind of like to constantly be a little bit like informative about this or like have an idea of going forward. But yeah. everyone's always in the same place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think a great person if we're looking for like where these roles can fit on our sets. The director is really the cheerleader for the whole crew because they're leading the circus. And so like after each take, it's usually the director talks to the talent, right? You've done, this is great, this is great, more of that, whatever, or no, no, none of that. Um, <laughs> but it's also okay to, to add those positive comments to the crew. You know, when I'm, when I'm on a set and I'm directing, that's what I do. You know, after we've had a couple of takes and we're moving on to a new setup, like it's just, a, it takes two seconds just to be like, all right, we're all, we're, we're getting there, we're almost there, like, thank you guys so much for your work, like, let's move on until lunch. And then maybe at that lunch break, at your, especially at a student level, having like another mini kind of safety meeting for the rest of the day. Like, everybody ate, everybody's hy hydrated, we had enough water, okay, well, like, let's try to kick this out in five more hours and then be done. I think that's so important to bring up because quite often on these sets you're the editor but you're also the gaffer or you're the director but then like suddenly you're standing in for talent or and so you just have a natural crossover because that's the nature of being um, being at this level with many crews to begin with and so what happens too is when you start to be attracted to a role of director or DP is you, you hyper understand what that role is but you may not understand everything a sound mixer does, or you may not understand all of the responsibilities of your QPA, production assistant, or you may not understand the responsibilities of an AD. And so having that, those conversations in pre-production of like what people are responsible for should really help your lines of communication when you're on set. Yeah. Do you wanna add anything to that? Can we do it? The, um, the sexual harassment part a little bit. So, you guys, if you experience any kind of sexual harassment, it's really important uh, we ask you to report it to either your faculty member, Mark or I, Jenna, uh, like I said earlier, teacher you feel comfortable with. We are mandatory reporters, and what that means is we have to then report it to the university. Like, we have to, and we cannot do it anonymously. So we have to give them your name, but everything is kept confidential. So it's really important to understand that, but it's really important that we know that so that we can make sure these things are not happening. Um, whether it's part of your crew, if it was one of your actors, it's really, really, we take this very, very seriously. Um, so we need to know um, so that we can, you know, make sure it doesn't happen again and do whatever we can do to kind of stop it. Um, so 
just, you know, we know you might not always feel comfortable talking to somebody on set, but please try to find a faculty member or a staff member that you can talk to, because um, mm -hmm. that's what we're here for. Um, and we go to training for it, and we talk to Title IX a whole lot. But what we found is students don't say anything except to each other, and then the rumor mill gets started, and it just kind of grows and grows, and then we get students angry coming to us saying, why didn't you do something about this student? And we are like, we had no idea this was happening. Um, we can overhear things, but unless you guys are coming to us and kind of letting us know. Um, there is a process that has to go through it, which cannot always be really convenient, but it's all there for your safety. I, I can add to that that we can't investigate. And yeah. so if there is a rumor mill, if, it's still important to report if you're concerned about your friend. Um, but unfortunately, if it's like 10 stories removed from the original person that it's about, we cannot go up to that student and ask them what happened. And then in addition to that, I have unfortunately had a few cases where people have reported to me two years after an incident. And I can offer, and I will offer, and we will all offer emotional support to you, and we'll be here to listen and be allies to you. But if it's two years down the road and you've graduated, that is the extent of what we can offer you. And so if you, if you see something or if you feel something, um, I, I invite you to really think about uh, saying something immediately um, and, not, and not hesitating and, and realizing that if it is in my class but you don't feel comfortable talking to me, you can report to a different professor. It doesn't have to be in line with that class. You can talk to any faculty member or staff um, and, and you should not ever feel like you have to handle it yourself. And that goes back to confidence in general about that like little voice about set safety. That the same thing happens with harassment. If you slightly feel like something is wrong, it does not have to be like the hard hitting definition of sexual harassment. Like if you feel like somebody is texting you too much or if they're kind of lingering around in the back of class every time you go to leave, things that just make you feel uncomfortable, these are all things that can be reported, um, that we can be aware of, that we can help you with. So, yes? The shop steward, right? On like the professional shop? Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. So, can you identify the shop steward? Cool, so that's the a great question. So, shop steward, so there's a, the number one rule about a shop steward is that first day of production, the shop steward is elected by the crew. It's not somebody that just shows up and says, I'm the person. So if I wanted to be a shop steward, I would walk on the first day of set and before lunch, so six hours, I would go to as many crew members of my local, of another local as possible and ask if they're comfortable with me being shop steward. Uh, and then at lunch, technically what you're supposed to do is have an open vote. Uh, and essentially it's, you know, majority rules. Um, and sometimes it doesn't happen. A lot of times, especially in this area, there aren't a lot of people that are or want to be shop stewards because it is a responsibility. Um, there are benefits to it, uh, you know, but you don't get paid for it, but um, you know, there are some other benefits for it, but it is a really big responsibility. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not something that you should take lightly, but it's very similar to this situation where if a crew member has an issue, they can come to me and talk to me about it. But in that regard, I have every right to go to the person that maybe someone's complaining about and speak to that person privately, anonymously about something that happened and see their side. And it's more of a mediation. Uh, and if something isn't coming together, then I would then go ahead and f do something called, I would file a grievance. Um, and that would go to our local and then our business agent of our local, who's the kind of like the main uh, representative of our, local, of our local will then kind of take charge and usually come visit set and then try to have an open mediation with myself and the both parties. So the way that that works on your level is you can go ahead and start putting shop steward in on your call sheets mm -hmm. and you can pick who that person is before you ever get to set and so it, it could be so and so director slash shop steward AD slash etc. So everybody knows immediately and it's okay also to maybe put a description on the bottom of the call sheet of what that means. Right. Because there might be somebody that's not here today um, that if you want to start doing this and I mean, we all invite you to start doing this now that, that you can just have a little asterisk, a little definition of what it is. <coughs> and so in terms of grievance that would be you reporting to a professor or a staff Correct. member and then that would be going to Title IX. But can I also just add to if it is ever a situation that you feel is significant enough and I'm talking about very severe sexual harassment here that you can also just immediately go to the police. 
So do not wait with something that is that significant to just go through a process of Title IX. If it is something that it involves, I don't want to like necessarily name, but if it's rape or if it's something that involves like heavy stalking or something you'd want a restraining order for, just go, go to the police about it as well. Absolutely. And you can always report to a faculty member for emotional support, but yes. Um, just to follow up, um, as like students, we are like day players, at least at first. So we're not like there on the first day a lot of times. We're just like showing up randomly in sure. the production. So like, is it super common knowledge? Mostly we just talk to each other. Like who do we talk to to ask like who is the shop steward? Is it like super common knowledge or would we ask someone specifically? So it's on the call sheet. Uh, it's usually on the call sheet. It's on the call sheet. Uh, and if it's not on the call sheet, you should request it to be on the call sheet. Uh, a lot of times you go on the bottom of a call sheet and it'll say first AD's name, second second AD's name, and second AD's name or UPM's name. Mm -hmm. It should be down there. Um, we're also kind of making this, trying to make this movement where a shop steward position, it, there's more than one shop steward on a job and that they are actually asterisks, there's an asterisk next to their name on the call sheet so it's easier so you don't have to find stuff. But um, know that you can just report to your department head, and, and they will report to the shop. That's steward. a big You don't thing have too. to find that's someone. Scary. <laughs> well, yeah. but you. But, but that's why there's a shop steward also available. Yeah. And that's why there's like a key PA who's like the you know there's. Yeah. Okay, so we are officially out of time, um, and we have so many more questions that we didn't get to. Um, so. I'll be around for a bit. I'm sure they'll be around for a bit. If you want to come up and talk to any of us about anything, like we're very happy to do that. Um, I just want to give Steve a round of applause for being here. Um, and, and, and I have everyone's emails. But yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 yeah, just hold on a second. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I have everyone's emails, but if, if there is a topic you really wanted to hear that, that you didn't, Please email email me or Travis or Mar anyone's email that you have up here, and and if there is feedback on how you'd like this event to be different next time or better or things that you'd like, we, we do this for you. This is not for us. Um, and so if you participated today, honor system. If you participated today, please come up and get some swag. Everybody though can get a sticker if you want a Union Ayatsi sticker. Um, feel free to come and get that. We have beanies and hats that Steve brought and then some EMF shirts if you don't have one yet. Um, and if you didn't sign in, please remember to sign in before you leave. Thank you guys so much for being part of Before you leave, real quick, um, real quick. Oh, right, don't leave. leave yet. Really, Sorry. really important. <laughs> so up here is, it's something, it's an application called the IATSE Safety Info App. So if you have, uh, so you can, it's a free app, download it. It'll ask you to put in a local number. You can put in uh, 487, you should write that down, just local 487, which is our local. Uh, you're totally allowed to use it. Uh, it gives you access to uh, safety hotlines that you have access to that they can either put you in touch with um, local authorities or they can kind of walk you through problems. Uh, and then there's also a lot of rules and regulations uh, and on a safety bulletin in that app that are all union rules that you should not be afraid to take to a non-union production or a film production. If you have concerns about things, you can definitely go on there and check it out and see what a professional set would do or what they would, who they, you know, how they would approach problems. It's all in that application and it's totally free. Um, so I highly recommend downloading that app. And please awesome. try to let us know or your faculty member um, if you're seeing really unsafe practices. We cannot stop these things if we don't know they're going on and we're not on set with you. So it's really up to you. And that kind of stuff we don't have to report so we can take it anonymously. Yeah. Or we can have an event where we're like, hey, we all need to cover this because apparently it is widespread. So yeah. that's how we come up with these kind of events is talking to you guys. Yeah. So It's not tattling, it's, it's just really helping not. us realize what you need more information on and better ways that we can teach you. So. Um, please look out for production kickoff week. Uh, we'll look at your emails. We're going to do a lot of those events like, for example, um, your setups if you want to learn specific lighting setups or any more like help with pre-production or post. Um, we're going to do another rough cut event too where hopefully we'll see you all there critiquing each other's rough cuts for your end of semester screenings. Yeah, and we'll have an event, um, how to run a set, and um, Jack Shoulder will be here again for that for you guys. So. Cool. Thank you so much. Have a great day. I'm going to set the bucket if you have more thoughts around the table. Also, if you have any questions about uh, our local.